preparing. One second. And we are live. Good evening and welcome to another program from the James Monroe Museum. My name is Scott Harris, I'm Executive Director of Museums at the University of Mary Washington. We welcome our online audience to tonight's program. And uh, we want to remind you that this Facebook Live program will be available later on the Facebook page of the James Monroe Museum and also on the museum's YouTube channel. You can find a lot of other programming there that we've done over the last year and uh, encourage you to check those things out. Um, we want to thank the sponsors that we have, um, the uh, sponsors who have done program support for a long time for the museum, even before we started to go to online formats. And we're grateful that that support has continued. Uh, it includes Fredericksburg Savings Charitable Foundation, uh, the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, which is administered by our friend Walter Sheffield, the Stuart Jones Charitable Trust, and of course, the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. Um, if you would care to uh, become a member of the Friends or support uh, the museum's efforts, you'll have opportunities uh, that pop up uh, in the, the uh, window uh, on your computer, or you can simply go to either the website of the James Monroe Museum or the University of Mary Washington and find giving opportunities there. We'd be grateful for your support. Um, there are a number of other upcoming programs that the museum's doing that I just want to mention. Um, we are working, James Monroe Museum is working um, in a partnership with the New York Historical Society uh, on a program they developed to help citizens, prospective citizens, uh, study for the citizenship exam, 100 question exam, uh, that is part of the process of becoming a U.S. citizen. And so that citizenship project, which is a six week course of study that will begin on October 25th, will involve using documents and artifacts from the James Monroe Museum's collection in support of preparing for that exam. Uh, this is our first time out doing it, and so we're very excited to be a part of this initiative. And we are still accepting people to sign up for it. So if you uh, either are a prospective citizen or know of someone who is, you're encouraged uh, to contact Lindsay Crawford, our public programs coordinator, and her email is lcrawford, that's L C R A. W-F-O-R at umw.edu. Lindsay is also the person as always working the board for us tonight uh, to make sure that this program gets out over the ether. Um, we also have a couple of other things coming up. The 34th annual James Monroe Lecture uh, will be on November 4th, beginning at 7 p.m. That'll be a Facebook Live event as all of these programs are. And it will feature author Tim McGrath, whose biography on James Monroe, titled James Monroe, A Life, we kid that he took a long time coming up with that title, uh, was published in 2020. It's the most recent, very comprehensive one volume uh, biography of James Monroe. And we're excited to be able to talk with Tim about that book, uh, about the process of writing uh, a major biography. And so we hope you will join us for that on November 4th. On November 10th at six o'clock PM, uh, the James Renault Museum, in partnership once again with the James Farmer Multicultural Center of the University of Mary Washington, will be doing another Native American Heritage Month program. And this one's quite interesting. I, I mean, they're all interesting, but this one's got a, a distinctive aspect to it because it is called Creating Change, Perspectives of Women in Tribal Leadership. We're fortunate to have Ann Richardson of the Rappahannock Tribe and Glenna Wallace chief of the Eastern Shawnee. Um, they'll be talking about their experiences, not only as Native American leaders, but particularly women uh, fulfilling those roles. So that will be, uh, as I said, November 10th at 6 p.m. Uh, finally, as we get into the end of the year, Deck the Halls with Jan Williams, our perennial favorite holiday decorating workshop will once again be done as a live uh, online presentation. That is December 4th at 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, once again, if you sign up for that, pay the uh, uh, ticket price for that, you will be entered into the raffle for one of the wonderful holiday creations that Jan makes. And uh, we, again, appreciate the support derived from that program for the museum's uh, public activities. We're taking the uh, Yuletide concept a little further this year at the museum and are doing uh, the week following uh, Deck the Halls, the week of the 6th through 11th of December is Mary Monroe. 
And we'll soon be announcing a variety of programs online that we'll be doing every day uh, that will get the James Renault Museum and hopefully our audience into the Christmas or holiday spirit uh, in, in ways that would be reminiscent of Monroe's time. So all of these things, as I say, um, you can find out about from the Facebook page uh, of the James Rome Museum. Uh, you can also, uh, as you, um, if you can't make some of them, want to come back to them later, look on the Facebook page and on YouTube channel. So tonight we are going to be reading the president's mail. And despite the uh, somewhat subversive title that uh, we came up for that, it's actually something that's a really wonderful exercise in learning how the process of documentary uh, editing uh, is carried out with a project that's right here um, in our own backyard. Um, we're very fortunate to have Bob Karachuk with us tonight. He is editor and project director of the Papers of James Monroe, a publication project that has been at the University of Mary Washington um, since 1999. And Bob will be discussing tonight just what the papers is, how the project works, and the role of the folks who have been a part of it. Um, Bob has worked on a variety of documentary editions, uh, including the documentary history of the Supreme Court of the United States, also the papers of John Adams and the Adams family correspondence, and that is the Adams family of Massachusetts, not the one uh, that lives in the weird house and does the fencing. I'm sure you probably know that. Uh, Bob's also involved with the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant and the papers of the Revolutionary Era, Revolutionary Era Pinckney Statesman, that, that marvelous family of South Carolina who uh, were contemporaries of James Monroe in many cases. Bob received a BA in history and political science from Yale, following that with a master's in history from the University of New Orleans, a Juris Doctorate from Tulane Law School and doctoral studies at uh, University of Connecticut. He joined the staff of the papers of James Monroe in 2018 as assistant editor and became editor and project manager in 2020. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our friend and colleague, Bob Karachuk. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay, this evening I'll be talking about the papers of James Monroe, which is a project that has two parents, the James Monroe Museum and the University of Mary Washington. And I'll be talking more about that relationship as I go along. <clears throat> the title of my presentation this evening is Reading the President's Mail. This is an insider's view of the papers of James Monroe. This is my perspective on the work. Um, let me just move into it. Okay, the first thing that we need to do is a little bit, just a little bit of background on James Monroe. To study somebody to collect their papers, you need to know who they are in the sense of why would you bother um, studying this subject. This um, calendar of James Monroe's service is not complete. It's the highlights of the work that he did for Virginia, for the United States, and in a certain sense, for the larger world. He was an officer of the Continental Army. He was a Lieutenant Colonel in the, of the Virginia militia. He was a Virginia delegate to the Confederation Congress. He was a US Senator, a minister to France, governor of Virginia, envoy to France, minister to Britain, envoy to Spain, Secretary of State, Secretary of War, and finally culminating his public career as president. The reason why I wanted to point out these highlights of his public service career is that they give some insight into where to look for documents. Let's move on. A little bit of background on the papers of James Monroe. The purpose of our project is to make documents related to James Monroe more accessible to researchers. Our audience is scholars. Our audience is curious individuals. Our audience can be students. It can be historians. It can be anybody who is studying the past. The papers that we look for are those of James Monroe. And what we mean by that 
is they were, in short, written by him or read by him. That is the most succinct way of describing the materials that we're looking for. They are a product of James Monroe's thinking or they were contributors to his experience that informed his thinking. The point of what we do is not only to collect the papers of James Monroe, but to publish the papers of James Monroe. The project has been around since 1989. And at this point, we've um, published seven out of 10 volumes. We expect to be around for another 10 or 12 years, perhaps more, depending always on funding. Our founding father was Dan Preston. He's the one who originated this project. He is the one who led the project over the last 30 years. Dan retired just in 2020. He not only started this project, which was an accomplishment in itself, but he's the most informed scholar of James Monroe. It's been my good fortune to succeed him and my bad fortune in the sense that Dan has 30 years of knowledge that we won't regain for another 27 years, by which time we should be done. Other people on the staff include myself. And as Scott said, I've been here for three years now. And also Heidi Stello. She's our assistant editor and she's far more knowledgeable about the content of the material than I am. I would argue that between the two of us, Heidi is the one who knows Monroe and the collection of papers that has been brought together here at the University of Mary Washington. I'm the one who has experience in the process of documentary editing and the publishing process. And now a word from our sponsors. The uh, two institutions that are most important to the papers of James Monroe are the James Monroe Museum and the University of Mary Washington. The James Monroe Museum is administered by the University of Mary Washington and the papers of James Monroe is, is administered by the museum. We're, we're provided with all sorts of services and facilities at the university that enable us to do our work. The other important sponsors that we have are the National Endowment for the Humanities, which provides the largest share of the financial support that we have, virtually all of which goes to labor. And we've also received funding from the Stuart Jones Charitable Trust. These are all of our current supporters. We've had support from the National Archives in the past and from uh, several other nonprofit entities. I should add as well that we have a, an anonymous supporter who we also would like to thank. The editorial process, what it takes to bring a James Monroe manuscript from the archive to publication can be summed up in seven easy steps. And if you can't tell, I'm being a little sarcastic about the easy part. First, we need to locate the manuscripts. Second, we need to catalog the manuscripts so we know what we have, what we're looking at. We also need to actually collect the manuscripts because if we're going to publish them, we need the content. Then we transition into selecting. We need to select which manuscripts we want to publish because we are not a comprehensive edition. There are other projects out there, particularly in the founding era, that publish theoretically all the papers of their subjects. We do not have the resources to take that approach. The fifth step is to transcribe the manuscripts, which means simply to take the original handwritten 18th or 19th century artifact and transcribe it or create a, 
um, a typed text out of it. The next step is to annotate. And what we mean by annotate is to contextualize what we're seeing in the document, what's going on around the document, to give a sense of how this document fits in the story of James Monroe's life or his times. And the seventh task is simply to publish. It all seems very straightforward, and I'm going to be spending the rest of our time this evening talking about these um, various steps. We essentially are going to be sprinting a marathon. So I'm sorry if I go quickly. Please feel free to ask questions at the end or to get in touch with me after the fact. The first step in the editorial process is to locate the manuscripts. In the circumstances of the James Monroe documents out there in the world, whether they are letters to him, letters from him, financial records, land records, legal records, um, newspaper essays, books, um, virtually any kind of document could be a James Monroe document if it feeds into his life. There are total known universe of James Monroe documents as of two days ago at 38,398. And I will let you know how we know that and why it's incomplete as we go along this, this conversation. The vast majority of James Monroe documents relate to his service in the federal government. And by virtue of that, they are um, a, a great number held by the National Archives. There are two National Archives facilities that particularly are of interest to us. One is the main building in Washington, DC, and the other is the National Archives at College Park. There are 25,137 Monroe documents in those two facilities. That's roughly two thirds of the known Monroe documents out in the world. Another important repository of Monroe documents is the Library of Congress, the Madison Building in particular, which houses the manuscript reading room in Washington. Library of Congress has a little bit over 5,000 Monroe documents. That's about an eighth of the Monroe documents out in the world. And again, most of those um, relate to his career in public service. Looking at the National Archives in particular, the documents that are held there relating to Monroe's federal service, more than half of those relate to his time in the State Department or overseas representing the United States. About a third relate to, or, or I'm sorry, are in collections of the War Department which makes sense because Monroe was not only a soldier of the revolution, but he was also secretary of war acting and himself uh, at the time of the war of 1812. Considering his service in the Confederation Congress and the Senate, there are about 10% of the documents in the National Archives. Interestingly about the Library of Congress materials, the James Monroe, the, the collection of James Monroe papers has about 3,000 documents, roughly two thirds um, of what the Library of Congress holds. Other big collections are, of course, the Jefferson Papers and the Madison Papers. Those two were allies and sometimes, well, those two were allies of Monroe. Jefferson was certainly a mentor and Madison was also a rival at times. Okay, so that covers the, um, the, the portion of documents that are in the federal repositories. Then we can move on to a couple other big repositories of James Monroe materials. One is the Library of Virginia, which is the state archives for Virginia. There are almost 3000 documents of, related to Monroe there, which really run the gamut. They relate to his time as governor, they relate to his time in the Virginia legislature, they relate to land records and legal records. They account for about 8% of all Monroe documents out there. 
Another place that has a lot of Monroe documents is the New York Public Library in New York City. They have about 2,500 Monroe documents, and that's about 6%. What I'm getting at with these percentages is that between the federal repositories and these two repositories, all the documents that they hold together cover about 92% of all the Monroe documents that are known. Or again, known and that we need to talk about a little bit more. A last important location for finding James Monroe materials happens to be right here in Fredericksburg. It's the James Monroe Museum. And we have access to the originals there. There are approximately 650 or 700 James Monroe documents. And the reason why I kind of waffle on the number here is that 668 of those documents are actual James Monroe letters or James Monroe documents in the sense that they are written by James Monroe or they were received by James Monroe. The James Monroe Museum has a good number of other interesting materials that are relevant to James Monroe. And this happens other places as well, but again, the collection at the Monroe Museum um, has several. These are the kinds of documents that are not to or from Monroe, but they are to or from people who represented him or communicated with him. There are things like overseers records or attor uh, attorney's communications on his behalf, um, financial accounts where somebody else has written up the account, but it's what James Monroe owns. These count as Monroe documents for our purposes because they are products of his existence. Okay, once you've located all these Monroe documents, and again, we're talking about 38,000 documents at this point, with almost 90% of them being in federal hands. When you think about um, where else might you look? Well, there are 185 institutional repositories that have Monroe materials. And Dan Preston, when he started this project, spent his first few years contacting these repositories, visiting these repositories, and collecting these materials. There are also other places to look, though. Private individuals hold James Monroe materials, and sometimes they show up in the manuscript market. So we also need to keep track of what's happening in auction house, auction house catalogs, and also that old standby eBay. Moving on. Okay, a catalog of treasures. Once Dan Preston located this vast number of James Monroe documents, he spent several years cataloging the materials. Um, he produced in 2001 a two volume comprehensive catalog and it was comprehensive at the time, but it soon went out of date. And the reason why it soon went out of date is because we continued to find Monroe materials. Basically, once you start searching for manuscripts on a given subject, people learn that you're interested and they can come out of the woodwork or out of people's attics, trunks, or libraries or collections that you just didn't know about. Now the catalog is important because it organizes um, the collection of documents going forward. The catalog includes the recipient of a letter or the um, author of a document. It includes a date. It includes a summary. It includes the location for where the document can be found. And it might even include where the document has been printed previously. Now, this 2001 print catalog was a godsend. And at the same time, it became um, out of date very quickly. Since the publication of that print catalog, the Monroe Papers Project has created its catalog of treasures 2.0. This is the Monroe catalog online. 
which is based on the print edition, but includes updates and additions and corrections to the original catalog. This also has the advantage that it's word searchable. So when we look at the summaries, we can have a better idea of um, what some of the subjects are. Okay, so we've located 38,000 documents. We've got a sense of what's there, but we also need to collect. And this is the most important part because we want to know what's in the documents. We want to know whether we want to publish these. Collecting happens several different ways. The old fashioned way, which was up to the minute when we started this project, was simple photocopies. This particular photocopy that you're looking at right now is from the Rosenbach Museum and the Library. Those little red lines that you see going vertically up and down the paper say something to the effect of this image, this document is owned by the Rosenbach Museum and Library, um, not to be used without permission. So, okay, we've got a photocopy, that works. But time went on, microfilm. <sighs> microfilm is very difficult to work with. It's also a great way to compactly store um, any kind of image. This particular collection you're looking at right now is in our file cabinet. It's 19 reels, letters of application and recommendation during the administration of James Monroe. These are all the communications that Monroe and his administration received asking for jobs or recommending people for jobs. This alone has 2,142 Monroe documents in that little package right there. That's a lot. But we needed to know what was in there because it's all part of the Monroe story. Things got easier in the 1990s and in the early 2000s when, for instance, some microfilm started going online. In this instance, it's the Library of Congress that put together, uh, I'm sorry, that put online many of its digital collections. Um, the, what you're looking at right now is from the James Monroe papers, but it also should be noted that, as I said earlier, a lot of materials relevant to Monroe are in other collections, like the Thomas Jefferson papers at the Library of Congress, the James Madison papers at the Library of Congress. Using microfilm that has been digitized definitely makes things a lot easier, but only in terms of accessing things. The images, as you can see, are black and white. Sometimes they can be overexposed or underexposed. The quality is usually good enough, but not always. Time continued and we went into the universe of digital images. This particular document is owned by the James Monroe Museum and actually came into their collection um, relatively recently from our perspective. And what I mean by that is it came in too late to include in the volume of the papers of James Monroe that we would have included it in. Um, this is a furlough that James Monroe wrote out for John Wallace to um, take a leave of absence from the army for seven weeks. And it reads, Lieutenant Wallace of the 6th Pennsylvania Regiment has Lord Sterling's permission to be absent from the army seven weeks. It's signed James Monroe, aide de camp, February 23rd. And we know that it was from 1778 from outside context. I want you to remember this particular document because it's basically a document that you'd wonder whether we should publish it or not. And I'll explain when we move on to selection, but remember it, Monroe's furlough to John Wallace. Okay, so we had digital images that we're able to get from the museum. There are some archives that are putting digital images online. 
One of them is William and Mary. They've created a digital archive um, that has several collections, but there's a James Monroe Project collection. The beauty of this kind of online work is that the images are high resolution and often can be expanded, magnified, so you can get a really good look at what's going on in the document. Okay, so we've located 38,000 documents, we've cataloged them, and now we've started collecting. In the case of the Monroe Papers, we do not collect all documents because there are some documents that we're not sure we're going to publish. And there are some documents that we know we're not going to publish. We have limited space. And I wanna take the opportunity to use our current volume that we're working on, which is actually volume eight. Typo, um, pa Papers of James Monroe, volume eight as a case study of selection. Volume eight covers four years, 1817 to 1821. It covers, um, James Monroe's first term of the presidency. And that amounts to 5,349 documents altogether. And in each of our volumes, we can squeeze in 500, maybe 600 documents. I suspect in this case, we'll have fewer than the 600 because many of the documents we're looking at will be long things like Monroe's inaugural address, his um, annual messages to Congress. What kind of documents do we want to select? Okay, well, we're limited by the time period. So anything after he's inaugurated and before he begins his second term. There are certain documents that we won't publish things that we would think of as visually arresting, but so common as to be of very minimal value to a scholar. Things like military commissions, passports, ships papers, um, things that are essentially form documents that Monroe as president would have been obligated to sign because he was the person in authority. There wasn't any thought for him about it. Somebody met the, the requirements for which they um, merited that piece of paper. What we're trying to get at is what kinds of documents can tell us more about Monroe himself, his relationships with people, the events that are going on around him that are affecting him, the actions that he's taking or things that he's thinking. With the presidency, there's some obvious things, particularly the first term, the most important of which to me are the relationship that he has with his cabinet members. Remember, the president gets to choose who he works with. In Monroe's case, his secretary of state was John Quincy Adams. His secretary of treasury was William Crawford. His secretary of war was John Calhoun. He had an attorney general by the name of William Wirt. These people were under Monroe's authority and also acting to advise him. So how he communicated back and forth with them is important. There are also other themes that we'll be looking at, which include the Panic of 1819, um, the Missouri question. We also want to get some sense of who Monroe is as a person. So we'll include some, um, what we would call personal papers, but our difficulty there is that very few of Monroe's family papers survive. His communications with his wife, back and forth, he destroyed after she died. Family papers with his children don't survive. So we really don't get a sense of him as the, of his home life. 
We do have some plantation papers that we can get a sense of his private affairs. Um, we try really hard to treat the large issues and get a, get a, um, a broad view of who Monroe is as a person and what's affecting him. Now, okay, selection is hard because when you have thousands of documents and only hundreds of spots to, to fit them in, you need to pick and choose. I'm gonna move on. Um, once a document has been selected, the next step is to transcribe it. This is when we start with an original manuscript. In this case, a letter from Levitt Harris to James Monroe from the National Archives. This is an image that was taken from microfilm. Um, this is the first page and the last page of the image. You'll see that um, the quality of the image is okay. The handwriting is relatively straightforward. What we ask for a transcription is simply replicate the language, word for word, character for character. And there is some movement of certain elements, but the point is we need this original manuscript to become a typescript. For the most part, we rely on student workers and interns to give us a raw transcription. So you go from a manuscript to a raw transcription. In this case, I want to read what was produced by our transcriber. A subject of the deepest interest in my country, on which I now take the liberty to address you, has, I am more, at different times arrived the notice of the two there administrating. And it was with no little satisfaction that in conversing with Mr. Rush upon it, shortly after my return from Europe, I travel, that a corresponding feeling animated the present chief magistrate. Um, that is not an ideal transcription because in this instance, the transcriber has tried to write each word individually reading the word as it appears. And this is where transcribing gets to be very much not a routine task. Let's look at a cleaned up transcription. In this instance, we call it a collated transcription. And that simply means that the transcription has been compared to the original by somebody other than the transcriber. Uh, our best practice is that we do this twice. We have two senior editors reviewing what has been transcribed. Um, in this instance, what is crossed out in red was incorrect, and what has been replaced in blue is correct. It's very hard to follow in this kind of um, layout, but it shows how often things go astray for a few reasons. In the first instance, young people today, young people today by and large do not learn cursive, or if they learn cursive, they don't use it enough to become fluent in it. That's one thing. Another thing is that it's, not, it's, it's often not enough to just read the words, but you need to read the sentences. What makes sense as you read it? What doesn't make sense? And sometimes it's not even as simple as, does this make sense? But the use of language has changed. So we're talking about 21st century transcribers reading 18th and 19th century writing in 18th or 19th century language. And then beyond that, we often run into specialized papers. We have financial papers, legal papers, um, military papers. Whenever there, oh, diplomatic papers. If whenever there is some uh, area of expertise, how the language is used and how words are used becomes specialized. So we go from gibberish to a cleanup and we move on to all cleaned up. And here things start making sense. Again, I'll read just the first paragraph. A subject of the deepest interest to my country on which I now take the liberty to address you 
has, I'm aware, at different times, arrested the notice of the last two administrations. And it was with no little satisfaction that in conversing with Mr. Rush upon it, shortly after my return from Europe, I learned that a corresponding feeling animated the present chief magistrate. It makes sense, the flow is correct. So we've got a cleaned up transcription. Great, okay. Now we move on to the next step in the process. Annotation, building a framework of understanding one note at a time. Annotation is simply the process of contextualizing what is being said in a document or, or I should say, and where the document comes from. In this instance, you see the text of the letter transcribed on the left and you see the annotation that is included to explain what's going on on the right. The letter is from Monroe to William Woodford, and there's a footnote for Woodford. There's a great example of the kind of thing that we are trying to get at when we annotate. Who is William Woodford? That first note explains who he is. As you go through the letter, we get onto a second footnote, which explains what Monroe is doing at this time. That's another kind of contextualization that we need. Who are the people Monroe is interacting with? What is Monroe doing at the time that he's interacting with them? We also have the problem that when other documents are mentioned in a document, we wanna provide some sort of reference to them, especially if we're not um, publishing those documents ourselves. And the idea is that um, in many instances, the best way to convey what's going on in the document is to allow the documents around it to interact with it. In this instance, in this document, we move on to a third footnote where we actually have to say, the documents that are referred to in this document don't exist, that we know of. Um, they are unknown, they have not been located. We move on to another note, it's another idea of a human being, again, it's um, the kind of information you want to convey. The last note talks about circumstances, I guess I would say larger circumstances in what's going on in the world. To annotate or contextualize papers of James Monroe, it's, it starts with identifying your proper nouns, the people, the places, the things that are being mentioned, things like ships, things like documents. Um, but it goes beyond that to explain what's going on in the world around the document, what Monroe is up to, what's happening outside. To do this kind of contextualization, we rely on a lot of outside materials. The most obvious is what's on our reference shelf. First and foremost, it's the papers of James Monroe. We have published seven volumes so far. We expect to publish 10 volumes. What we've already uncovered helps us move forward. There are also other projects like the Monroe papers that cover the same time period and often cover aspects of Monroe's um, experience. The line of books under our reference shelf includes materials from John Quincy Adams and his wife, Louisa Catherine Adams, John Calhoun, Henry Clay. Calhoun was um, Secretary at War. Clay was Speaker of the House. Their diplomatic um, communications with um, South American nations, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, John Marshall, all of these collections of documents focused on subjects other than Monroe, and in, in the, most of these instances, other statesmen, there is deep research that can help us explain what's going on in the Monroe papers. Lower center in this particular image is um, the American National Biography, which is a um, set of biographies of important or influential Americans, it's a great starting point. Reference books. 
true reference books. We now have our reference shelf 2.0, and this is where in the last 20 years, the internet has been a godsend to the kind of work that we do. Um, in this instance, we have a century of lawmaking for a new nation, congressional documents and debates. Monroe's time in the federal government required lots of interaction with the legislature. So he is mentioned or actually communicates um, with either the House or the Senate. And oftentimes communications of his from his experience as a diplomat or secretary ended up as records that were conveyed to Congress. This is a website that's hosted by the Library of Congress. Incredibly helpful. America's Historical Newspapers is a, um, uh, a website um, hosted by a private company which took microfilm of newspapers that had been produced in the early part of the 20th century, digitized it, and now you can not only read the newspapers, but you can search them, keyword search them. Um, Founders Online is a, um, a website sponsored by the National Archives and actually put up by the University of Virginia Press. These are the same kinds of collections that appeared on our reference shelf in books, but now they've been digitized and again are searchable for the papers of George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, James Madison. It's wonderful to be able to research materials in books because indexes are incredibly valuable. But being able to do keyword searches is also very helpful too. The Had the Trust Digital Library is um, a consortium of libraries that have digitized their materials and make them available um, online. Those materials are entirely materials that are uh, in the public domain. And because we're doing research in the 19th and 18th centuries, that's that serves our purposes. The list of um, entries that you see to the left is a list of bookmarks on my desktop. And these are biographical dictionaries, like the American National Biography, for all sorts of different countries and states. There's for Spain, there's for France, there's for Italy, there's for the Netherlands, there's for Germany, there's for Sweden. And these were very useful in particular when looking at Monroe's time as a diplomat, um, because he was running into people during his time in Europe um, people who would be completely unknown in America, but who had important influential lives in their home countries. Okay, so for all this work, we've located, we have located and we have cataloged and we have cataloged and we have collected and we have collected and selected and we have selected and transcribed and we have transcribed and annotated and what we get at the end after several years of labor is the finished product, a volume, one volume at a time from the papers of James Monroe in print. This is our most recent published volume, volume seven, which came out last year. Our publisher is ABC Clio and they've been our publisher from the very beginning. Um, this volume has um, covers a time period where there were 11,890 documents that we could have chosen from. And in there are 613 documents. We were able to publish 5%, one in 20 of the documents of Monroe of the period. It seems like a little, but it's actually a lot. The finished product is not necessarily the finished product though, and this is news. The finished product 2.0 is coming, coming soon very likely by the end of this calendar year, the University of Virginia Press digital imprint called Rotunda um, hosts digitized editions of other founding era subjects and has agreed to add the Monroe papers to their collection online. 
This again is a terrific boon because books I love. I think they're the best. But a lot of research is now done online and that includes original research and secondary research. In this instance, getting our materials onto a, um, a website like Rotunda helps get our material out to other scholars, to researchers, to students, to teachers, to the general public. Okay, we've done the whole distance. This is the marathon. The sprint is over, but I need to say, to support the papers of James Monroe, please make a donation at the University of Mary Washington online giving website. Thank you very much. And I return the field to Scott Harris. Bob, thank you. Um, I will admit, I knew pretty much everything you were saying, but I still was fascinated to watch it unfold in the way that you described it. Um, and it just reinforces what a good decision that uh, Dan Preston and I and the others involved made and hiring you. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think we uh, uh, should also note um, your able assistant uh, editor Heidi Stello, who um, is is really the institutional memory of the project in yes. a lot of ways, has been with it almost from the beginning and has been uh, closely involved with the James Monroe Museum for many years, um, including her portrayal of Elizabeth Monroe. So um, I think we're very fortunate. And I, I mentioned Heidi both to acknowledge her and also to point out that that now constitutes 100% of the <laughs> professional staff of the papers. And I wonder if you could sort of put the papers of James and Rowan context to other documentary editing projects, both ones you've worked on and just others generally, because my, my sense and maybe the public sense is that it's a huge project, but we do it with a very lean team. Yes. Um, many projects have staffs as small as ours, but with more modest aspirations. Um, many projects with our aspirations have much larger staffs. Um, with the kind of work that we are attempting to do, often you would have a managing editor, you would have a senior editor focusing on the content, you'd have an assistant or an as associate editor as a second person, and you would have an editorial assistant as well as research assistants to help with the work. And at best, with that kind of staffing, you would likely get out of volume every two years, maybe every three. We at this point are working with myself as editor, and I'm, I guess I'm the senior editor as well as the managing editor. I'm actually only at 80%, so I'm not even a full person. Um, and Heidi, who's an assistant editor and really deserves a higher um, set of, uh, higher title than that, she is only half time. So she's even less of a person than I am. We together make up 1.3 people. And that means that our time to completion is going to be slowed down incredibly. We are hoping to produce a volume every five to six years. And even that will be kind of um, ambitious. Um, uh, I should remind our audience too, uh, or make sure our audience is aware that um, questions uh, that the audience might want to pose. We certainly welcome them. You can type those into the chat uh, box um, uh, within this webinar, and then they will be uh, asked. I will pass them on um, for Bob to answer. Um, and so we've got a couple of those starting to accumulate. Um, I, I, I do just want to maybe play off, though, one thing that was occurring to me uh, from what you just said, Bob, is uh, not only the situation of, of the number of people involved and, and the funding, which uh, the NEH funding especially is very important. And um, due to a number of factors, I think COVID being one of them, there was a reduction yes. in what NEH was awarding. So we worked with a bit less than what was originally requested and had to adjust to that. But what impacts did you have from the pandemic or have you had from the pandemic on the work um, yeah, to, to do all this. Um, the pandemic slowed us down in many different ways. Um, the most obvious is that 
as I was describing how we do our collecting, we work with photocopies, we work with microfilm, and we work with um, digital images. Digital images are very easy to take home. A flash drive or an external hard drive, you got the whole thing. Um, you can see file cabinets behind me contain our photocopies. Even if Heidi and I split the collection in half, we could not have access to it um, at home. It's just too much material. And then the problem with the microfilm is that we need micro, uh, microfilm reader and scanner to actually look at it. Mm -hmm. During part of the um, pandemic, campus was closed and that meant we couldn't get to the library to use the materials there. Um, another um, thing that slowed us down was that the National Archives and the Library of Congress for a very long time closed their facilities entirely, which meant we couldn't visit there and it was very difficult to get materials from there, which is another um, issue. Much of the microfilm that we need to look at, it, we get through interlibrary loan. Our library and an awful lot of other academic libraries who hold the materials that we want, um, they were all hands on deck to accommodate the digital needs of their students who suddenly left campus and were working remotely. So that interlibrary loan slowed down quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just the, an awful lot of the project development of understanding is in conversation with others. Heidi and I, um, we spend a lot of time talking through what we're working through to make sense and also to communicate to each other, hey, I'm hitting this here. It's relevant to what you're working on. You might wanna know about it. Um, so in a lot of ways, both logistically and um, I guess you'd say socially, it slowed us down. And of course, financially, definitely. Um, there are many more important things in the world right now than historical scholarship. And charitable giving has rightfully been focused on those more immediate issues. Um, well said, uh, noble, nobly said, uh, and yet we hope uh, as, as time goes on, people will uh, realize that um, for society to, uh, to truly know itself, it, it needs to invest in, in these sorts of efforts too. And I believe, I believe that we, we have seen some uh, uh, reaction in that way uh, to our situation from, from supporters of the museum, from the papers, and we're, we're grateful for that. Um, making the best of an awful, unexpected situation is a refrain we've been hearing and practicing for more than a year. And I, I think that the papers have particularly been very adaptable. And then in fact, throughout the life of the project have been very adaptable yeah. to a lot of changing circumstances. Um, our friend David Durham posed a question that kind of plays a little bit off of what you were just saying earlier about where collections are located. You cited sort of some of the, the major uh, concentrations of papers, right. but um, given that Monroe did national tours regional tours of the country and, and visited a number of states in the, the North in 1817, Chesapeake region in 1818, and then the South in 1819. Are there sort of, I guess, bits and pieces, uh, parts of collections at say University of Michigan or University of North Carolina or uh, uh, sites along the way, historical societies that may pertain to um, things that went on during his tours? Um, not so much things that went on during his tours. Um, but when he went on his tours, he was communi he, he was interacting with people he already knew, um, essentially the elites of the states and cities that he was traveling through were the people who were in the forefront of welcoming him. Um, and those were the people who you'd be communicating with. Um, he would certainly be sending letters back and forth to these people over time. So it's not so much necessarily about the tour, it's, it, tours, it's more about the people who he was interacting with and we, would be communicating with later. Absolutely, there are materials, sometimes one piece, um, and that's why we have 185 repositories that we have materials from. The, the big collections are very big, but the small collections are scattered 
and I mean, it's a real credit to Dan when he was doing his original uh, research that he reached out to several hundred um, different repositories saying, hey, do you have anything? Do you have anything you can send to me? Do you have so much that I need to show up? Um, so yes, all over the country, particularly university archives, um, particularly uh, collections from other elites of the era. And as you noted, uh, despite uh, every effort to comb through all that to, to do the, the work of, of, of identifying, contextualizing, publishing, as soon as you get something in print, something else pops up that could yes. have gone like yes. a furlough from Valley Forge. Yes, which, it, which is true. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually mention that. The furlough from Valley Forge is, it's an interesting object in that it's a routine document. The only thing that Monroe did was write it. It's not like he created it out of his own thinking. It's not like there's an argument to it. But when you compare it to things like the land deeds that he signed and the military commissions that he signed as president, um, the passports that he signed as secretary of state, this is one boilerplate document that absolutely we would have published because it's, it's unique. It's not just rare, it's unique. Um, and I think it's, I, I mean, it's a credit to the museum that they went out and, and got it when it showed up on the market. Well, I think um, not to go too far in the weeds on that, I, I, it's special to me because as director of the James Brown Museum, this is the first artifact we acquired after I became director. Ah. And so there's an opportunity to go out and talk to some of our friends and meet some friends who were willing to put the money up because we were actually approached, uh, Dan Preston was approached um, by a dealer um, who had known uh, Dan, had, had used him as a resource and authenticating things over the years. And because of its Monroe uh, subject matter, and as you say, the uniqueness of it, um, he basically gave the museum first crack at it before it went into the auction catalog. And while the museum does not have a great deal of money to spend on artifacts, um, there are some things that we really try to make the effort for, and this was one that it was possible to do. Um, uh, you're right in terms of the context of it, the fact that I, I think as far as we know, certainly of official documents, it's the earliest example of something Monroe signed. Yes. Um, and had anything to do with writing. So yeah, um, that, that uh, again, came along a little too late for the volume in which it would have uh, worked. But uh, now, uh, that will that find its way into uh, Rotunda in some way or somehow be associated with the earlier volumes, can it be as, or associated with the volume that it would normally would have appeared in in print in some fashion? Unfortunately, it won't. The, uh, what Rotunda by and large does, not entirely, but what it's mostly known for is taking print editions that date back to the 1950s, mm -hmm. um, modern editions like ours, digitizes those and provides um, the search understructure um, that allows just much easier access to the materials in the volume. It's a, in terms of the content, it's a reproduction of what's in the volumes, but it's an entirely different way of presenting it that is much more attuned to how we do research today with the mm -hmm. online tools that we have. Um, if there, I, I do hope that at some point we will get that um, furlough online in a different way. One of the things that our project has um, worked on for the last couple of years in conjunction with the museum, as you know, is what we're calling the James Monroe Digital Collaboration. And it's meant to serve several purposes, but in terms of the museum, um, we would like to get all of the original manuscripts held by the James Monroe Museum related to James Monroe online. And we mean to put up not only the images, but transcriptions that would therefore be searchable um, and some very robust metadata that will not, it won't go anywhere near replicating what we would do as annotation, um, but it will provide a sort of subject searching capacity beyond 
um, mere names and things like that. That is very similar, but a little bit more ambitious, I think, than what William and Mary has done with their collections of Monroe materials. Um, but again, to get the original image online, be able to look at it, be able to magnify it, be able to have a, a text behind it that you're searching. It's, it's very valuable. It's, it's, it's a great way to get closer to the document when you can't actually travel and get your hands on the document. Um, I do wonder too, uh, whether, and, and this is sort of, it, it's, it's a, maybe a self-serving question, but it's worth saying uh, and asking. <laughs> Um, do you feel that the, the, the effort of the papers of James Monroe has helped contribute toward, or toward a higher profile that Monroe has among scholars, um, in, in part because you have been able, the project has been able to put more of this uh, collection out in, in a thoughtful, organized, and um, contextualized way? Yeah. Uh, because there is, there, there's been a sense, we've sort of anecdotally felt, um, that James Monroe's uh, profile has risen over the last 25 years or so. Attribute some of that to the museum, certainly, but I think that the papers have helped that, certainly in the academic sense. So that's my sense anyway. Do you, do you feel that that's a valid uh, thought? Yes, so it, it's absolutely a valid thought. And um, it's really sort of the underpinning of what we do. We and I mean this for documentary editors in general, but also in terms of the Monroe papers, we go into the archives and gather everything so that in some sense, the material is in one place so that others can follow behind us and access those materials. Our, we like to think, and again, as you were saying, maybe it's self-serving, but we like to think that our selection of the materials for publication really does get at the most substantive of the documents that relate to Monroe and his experience. Um, if nothing else, and I don't think this is true, but if nothing else, it's sort of a tasting menu of what's in the larger collections of the Library of Congress and the National Archives and can not only produce um, you know, substantial volumes like Tim McGrath's biography or Rob Forbes's um, work on the uh, Missouri question, but it can also raise Monroe's stature in terms of historical curiosity. The more you expose something to the light, the more people want to see it and the deeper they'll dig to find it. So yes, this has definitely been a, a, a service to the scholarly community. And I also think to the, um, to the general public, um, the work that the museum has done to um, expose Monroe Moore and also the, the folks over at Highland down in Albemarle County. Yeah. Um, Monroe is definitely on the upswing in a way that others have already, other um, historical subjects have already experienced. And the reason why it's Monroe now is because enough material has gone out there that um, scholars have that critical mass to, to look at and to attract them. Yeah. Despite all of our best efforts though, he didn't make it into Hamilton. And for that, we will be uh, perpetually annoyed. But the sequel, the sequel. The sequel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll clean it up in the sequel. Um, Bob Karachuk, thank you very much. Um, we uh, appreciate you being able to sort of uh, show us how the sausage is made with regard mm -hmm. to the uh, not just this project, but documentary editing generally. Remind our audience that this can be uh, accessed uh, at the Facebook page or YouTube channel of the James Monroe Museum. Uh, we also invite you to uh, be tuning in for uh, both the 34th Annual James Monroe Lecture on November 4th, as well as our uh, Creating Change Perspectives of Women in Tribal Leadership Program November 10th. And you can find those programs as well uh, with respect uh, to uh, later on in the year uh, at the, uh, the sites I mentioned. Thank you very much for tuning in and good evening from the James Brown Museum. And, um, and